morning and welcome to worship. Hopefully this week will work a little better than last week, um, at least our first attempt last week. We have a few birthdays to announce this week. Uh, Haley Hovland, Gladys Jones, Ashley Keck, Randy Hasloy, Becky Nielsen, Kaylin Yokel, and Emma Wenish. And we have one anniversary to announce this week, Steve and Cindy Gayworth. Obviously, you won't be able to greet any of these folks after church, and you won't see them around town, but uh, if you have an opportunity to send them a message or give them a call and wish them a happy birthday or a happy anniversary, I'm sure they would appreciate it. Uh, this, this is probably not how they were planning to celebrate, so please uh, keep them in mind in the coming week. We begin our worship with the brief order for confession and forgiveness. We gather as we live in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. By the authority Christ has given to all the baptized, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this community of faith, and for all who offer their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. The Lord be with you. Let us pray together the prayer of the day. Holy One, your son came into this world, bringing salvation and life to all who believe. May your spirit breathe, the, breathe life into the dry bones of our lives so that we may follow and serve you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We haven't been able to do any music so far this way, but we're going to try something this morning and hopefully uh, it will work.
Our first reading this morning is taken from Ezekiel, the 37th chapter. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. And he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, Come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live, and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. Here ends the first reading. Please join in reading Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now trying to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of daylight? Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. After saying this, he told them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he will be all right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. And Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I'm glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. 
Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Mar Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping. He was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, that, he said where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Friends in Christ, grace to and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Mortal, can these bones live? And Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Our Old Testament and Gospel readings this morning both force us to face a reality we do all that we can to avoid. The reality of death. First, we have Ezekiel and his valley of dry bones. Now, Ezekiel was a prophet living among the exiles in Babylonia just prior to the fall of Jerusalem. For 10 years, Ezekiel relentlessly attacked not the Babylonians, but his own people with charges of faithlessness and idolatry. The problems facing their nation were not the fault of those foreign invaders. The fact that they were on the brink of collapse and defeat had nothing to do with the Babylonians. This could be squarely blamed on God's own people. Ezekiel was unfavor, unwavering in his pronouncements that God was intent on destroying the nation of Judah. Time after time, the Israelites had turned away from the covenant God had made with them. Time after time, they abandoned the ways God had laid out for them. Time after time, they had chased after false gods. And through it all, Ezekiel warned the people that God would not stand for this. 
And then Judah fell. The nation was destroyed. Ezekiel's gloomy words came to pass. People were cast into darkness. Everything Ezekiel had tried to warn them about, everything he'd tried to tell them was coming, finally came. The people were conquered. Battlefields were strewn with Judah's soldiers who had been crushed in battle. But no sooner had the nation been conquered, no sooner had he been proven right, than Ezekiel changed his message completely. He stopped preaching words of condemnation, instead bringing to the people a word of hope. Despite the harsh judgment that had been brought upon the nation, God wasn't done with them. God wasn't cutting them off forever. God would restore his people even though everything seemed lost. The valley of the dry bones is a vision of what God can and will do for his people. Those bones were dry as dust. There was no hope of life in them. There wasn't, this wasn't someone on an operating table getting resuscitated and their heart just momentarily stopped beating. Those bones were as dead as they could be. There was no reason to think they would live again. There was no reason to think anything good could come from this valley of death. Just as there was no reason for Mary and Martha to think that anything good would come from their brother's death. Lazarus and his sisters were dear friends of Jesus. They knew the kind of power he had over life and death. They knew the kinds of miracles he had performed. But when Lazarus lay dying, Jesus was nowhere to be found. He lingered where he was for two extra days before finally going to check on his friend. By then it was too late. By the time Jesus arrived in Bethany, Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days. There was nothing more for Jesus to do and all Mary and Martha could do was lament and accuse. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But it turns out there was more that Jesus could do. Jesus wasn't anywhere near being done with Lazarus or Mary or Martha. They were about to witness something they couldn't even imagine. Something maybe they weren't even sure they wanted to imagine. Jesus demanded that the tomb be opened and he called Lazarus out of death. Now Mar Martha tried to warn Jesus against this. The stench of death would surely overwhelm them if they opened up that tomb. They'd done all they could to cover the smell with perfumes and ointments before closing up the grave, but now it had been days in the heat of the Middle East. No good could come of opening that grave. In Ezekiel's valley, when the word of the Lord came upon those dried up bones, they stirred to life. The dust was shaken off, the joints came back together, the muscles reattached, and finally the breath of God came upon those bones, restoring them to life. And in Bethany, the dead man, Lazarus, walked out of his tomb very much alive. Such things are so much more than anyone would have thought to hope for. It's certainly more than we are willing to hope for most of the time. These two passages force us to face that thing we most fear and dread. We've made an art out of avoiding the reality of death as much as possible. Something like 80% of Americans die in hospitals or nursing homes, surrounded not by loved ones, but by professional medical staff. And then the funeral home is called and the family doesn't see that loved one again until they've had their hair and makeup done. How different that is from the experience of Mary and Martha, who cared for their beloved brother right up until he died, and then prepared his body for burial themselves. And we even managed to keep deaths in war pretty far out of our minds, pretty much on the back burner. They happen so far away and so rarely that we have almost let ourselves forget that we've had troops in the field continuously for something like 80 years. How different 
in ancient Judah, where the bodies of those slain in battle scattered the valley floor as a constant reminder of the cost of Judah's freedom. We do our best to not think about things like this. We prefer to focus on life and health, on youth and joy. But now, even without the, our readings this morning, we've come face to face with the power of death. Every morning and afternoon, we get the numbers. All day, every day, you can hear statisticians running out their dire projections. A friend in Seattle, where schools have been closed for even longer than here, discovered that her kids had set up a coronavirus hospital in their toy room. This fear and stench of death is in all of our nostrils, young and old. And frankly, we've had about enough of it. We're ready to move on, hopefully, before it touches us too closely, too directly. The people of Israel felt like those dry bones in Ezekiel's valley. God had forsaken them, abandoned them, given them up. Their nation was dead. They were in exile, conquered by a foreign power. There was no reason to hope that anything good could yet be in store for these people. There was no reason to think God would come back to them, that God would come back for them. But Ezekiel brought this word of hope into the midst of their despair. He brought this ray of light into their darkness. Mary and Martha thought Jesus had abandoned them, letting their beloved brother die without making even an attempt to heal him. And then Jesus just brought him out of the tomb. Their darkest night was turned to dawn. Their mourning was turned to dancing. There are times when the darkness in our world can seem pretty overwhelming. When it seems like we've maybe been abandoned to face the darkness alone, and we're living in one of those times. The shadows press in and threaten to extinguish the light. And at times we find ourselves thinking that maybe there really is no light. Maybe all is lost. Jesus hasn't shown up when we needed him. Our bones are drying up. Facing the darkness in our world leads some to despair, leads some to cynicism some to self-delusion, some to idolatry. If left to our own devices, the shadows would swallow us up. But God is bringing his light into our darkness. God is bringing his word of hope into our doubt. Darkness, sin, death, these do not have the last word. The last word, the final word belongs to God. And his answer to the question, can these bones live, is a resounding yes. His response to death is nothing less than new life. These bones, your bones, can live. These people, you, who are overcome by death, are being brought to new life. You who are lost and wandering are being brought home. This world that sits in darkness and fear is being brought into the light. Even when all seems lost, even when your bones have been turned to dust in the grave, even then, God's power over you remains, and God's promise to you remains. Even in the midst of death, your life is being restored. The breath of God is coming upon you, and you will finally walk in a new life, an everlasting life, a life not touched by the stain of sin and death. And one day you too will hear the voice of your Savior calling you out of the grave saying, Beloved child, come out and you will be raised up. Until that day comes, you have the sure and certain promise of God that nothing in this world is out of his hands. Nothing in this world is beyond his power to redeem. Nothing in you is ever beyond his reach. Come what may, you are safely in the care of your Savior, no matter what. And he has already defeated this enemy that has us so terrified. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.
Now let us confess our common faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. At this point in the service, we normally would have the sharing of the peace. Uh, and what I'd like to encourage you to do whenever you happen to view this, uh, this recording and join in this worship service, I'd like you to just uh, grab your phone and text or call half a dozen people and share the peace of God with them. Uh, even if you're watching this late tonight or tomorrow or whenever, just share a word of God's peace uh, with the, your fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ. But now let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for your promise that out of death, you are bringing new life. Send your spirit upon us that we might live in confidence that you can and will fulfill this promise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, we pray that you would keep this nation in your care. Grant wisdom to our leaders that they would seek to work for the good of all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, you are the hope of those in despair, the comfort of those in sorrow, the strength of those who are weak. We pray for your presence now with all those in special need, sick, dying, grieving, the lonely and the forgotten. Especially those we name now in our hearts before you. Bind up the wounds of all your people and restore them to wholeness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit.